Welcome everyone to our second lecture within our IRTV program. Um, Gabo Heindl is going to talk about the topic just architecture. Gabo Heindl is an architect, urbanist and activist based in Vienna. She studied architecture at the University of Fine Arts in Vienna and Tokyo and completed a postgraduate degree in architecture and urban design at Princeton University in the US. She also holds a doctor in philosophy and in 2007 she founded her own architectural practice. The practice is mostly working on public buildings and cultural, educational and infrastructure facilities. She works in various scales from small installations and conversions to urban planning. Next to planning and building, she's concerned with research, mainly touching upon the topics of public urban space and housing in the context of equality. Her latest publication, Stadtkonflikte, was released just this Saturday. She is and has been teaching at multiple universities as the Chiu Delft AA School of Architecture and the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. We are very happy to have her here today and we are looking forward to her talk. The screen is yours, Gab. Thank you. I just muted myself. Hello, everybody. Thank you very for the invitation. I hope you hear me well. Anybody um, thumbs up? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now. Is it there? Screen shared? Yeah. Yes. Okay, super. Thank you very much. Okay, um, well, thanks for this um, invitation. I'm very pleased um, that um, actually to hear that you're organizing such a conference, uh, which is uh, really so important and it's great um, to be. Um, self-initiated to be actually uh, demanding um, something of your architectural studies uh, of architecture itself and I hope to contribute um, to that. I'm going to um, take my screen out um, in order to actually um, possibly not, um, uh, if the, it only, only so to say if the connection is not, not good enough. So what I'm uh, talking about, um, first um, I would like to basically explain or um, describe myself as a practicing architect. Um, I have an office in Vienna and within my office we are actually working um, in between uh, like with different scales, different projects, but one thing is consistent within all these projects, it's publicness. It's about public building, public space um, and the issue of um, questions of the agency of the architect. So um, my practice, I would actually call it um, theory-based practice while I'm also doing, um, or I'm also interested in practice-based theory. Um, this meaning uh, that basically I publish and publishing and writing is something that I find really important um, as an architect just as much. Um, what you see here is uh, a, a study that we did for the Chamber of Labor in Vienna, um, Gerechte Stadt muss sein, um, the title already implies um, or relates to the, to, uh, to the title of my talk, Justice. But then also, for instance, I'm interested in uh, criticality, in the question of um, how to be able to uh, critique within architecture and actually to actively be, or let's say, be active while critiquing. Yeah. So literally, um, this is the title of the book, uh, obviously, building critique or like uh, uh, building while critiquing, so to say. My recent, however, book, um, and this is really a monography that I would like to um, base uh, this talk on, is called Stadtkonflikte. It really just um, came out um, and it um, deals with radical democracy in architecture and urban planning. Um, and it basically has three major parts. Um, one part, uh, number one, is poli called politics, second, planning, third, popular agency. And uh, as you can already see, these are three P's, um, PPP. It is really also a, um, an agenda. It's a manifesto against uh, neoliberal um, planning in uh, contemporary times. So it's taking the notion of PPP and rewriting it. Not so basically claiming that we need something else than public-private partnerships in urban planning. Namely, we need politics we need proper planning and we need uh, popular agency. I will um, just briefly run you through this, um, not really, don't worry, don't read all this um, um, content, it's much too much, but uh, just to give you an overview, the first um, uh, main part of this book is on politics based uh, on the historic notion of Red Vienna 
and then try, trying to see what we can inherit critically for future visions and uh, contemporary challenges um, of urban planning today. Just quickly, because the second part is on planning, um, and this is what I will um, obviously um, concentrate on with you today. Um, but what with the part of planning interests me is basically the notion that there's a literal crisis in planning, meaning um, that, and maybe you can share this with uh, me, the question of like um, how to plan within such crisis, uh, how to plan actually in contemporary times uh, while uh, knowing that um, so many things would have to be done or known and we'll get into this um, in a moment. Um, so this is where I actually establish some, you, you could say some sort of um, critique of the practice um, of architecture or nearly it actually um, a, um, a theory of the practice of architecture. And the third part of the book is called Popular Agency. And I will also describe and, and um, I brought you some projects uh, that are based very much uh, in popular agency that are actually bottom up um, initiated uh, by um, NGOs, by groups, uh, by, by movements, um, especially in Vienna, since I'm based there. And um, I strongly believe that we need to actually build alliances uh, between architecture and um, movements, protests, um, and I guess this is, um, I just wanted to make you curious about the book and actually possibly all get, get the book. So in uh, looking into planning, because this is, I guess, what we are all doing, um, I would like to first quickly actually say that planning is um, something or architecture is something that is not just an, in, not just a talk we are talking about, um, but uh, this is, it's also, for instance, something, it's, it's a secret obsession, for instance, of cinema. This is a project that I'm doing with my partner, um, Reli Robnik. I've been doing it for the last 10 years, actually collecting scenes in films, in very popular films, uh, in feature films, that are actually portraying physical architectural models. And believe it or not, there's millions, not millions, but we have a collection of 200 films of these. Uh, but we could also say that even film um, history or the film, film makers are obsessed with architecture. Um, this is a, like, it's of course beautiful to show such projects um, then within conditions here, for instance, in Hong Kong, um, where um, films of the 60s um, are still, as a historic film, basically relating to a condition um, uh, that we sit in this in this uh, moment, uh, kind of sitting right within. So um, this was just a little introduction to get us to the actual points that I want to um, talk about. My book is dealing with radical democracy, uh, radical democracy in urban space. So it was also the term, or the, is also the topic of um, a unit I'm currently teaching at DAA in London, and. Uh, if I wanted to describe radical democracy briefly or in very short terms, then it's a political theory that basically says when democracy is in crisis, uh, we should not give up on democracy, but we should actually democratize even more. So if we, see, if we think of crisis, then of course we do think of, uh, I, I, would, I would say, many crises that are currently um, financial crisis. So ecological crisis, COVID-19 being even uh, kind of emphasizing and accelerating. Um, and uh, with that, there's also a kind of democracy crisis uh, within architecture. And also a question of where our agency is. So, based, so, so uh, what we did, so for instance, um, in London is to look at Earth in London, and I'm showing you an image of Vienna. Of course, um, so uh, on the left side, you see Vienna, Karl Marxhof, um, and on the right side, you actually see Robin Hood Gardens in London. And while Karl Marxhof in Vienna is still standing strong, Robin Hood Gardens by the Smithsons is currently being destroyed. So uh, what, does, um, what do I want to say with that? Uh, we actually have a crisis um, within also um, architecture in terms of social housing, uh, in terms of uh, public space, um, and we have very complicated uh, conditions of planning. Yeah? Conditions of planning meaning that uh, facing, and this is really, um, I can only go through this very quickly and um, I'm just describing this um, in more intensity, of course, in my book. Um, so uh, we, are, it's, it's, uh, we are planning in a time that is, um, we could call it a post-fortress time uh, based on flexibilization. 
uh, within neoliberalism and financialization of um, urban space, um, uh, experiencing some sort of end of the welfare state. Believe me, I mean, I'm, it's about not about fighting, of course, this end. Um, uh, scarcity actually creating some sorts of uh, scare cities, uh, cities uh, in which uh, people actually um, are scared, possibly, be it racial profiling, uh, be it um, using public space uh, where they're not supposed to be. I mentioned the, pub, uh, the climate crisis and so on. So there's enormous um, difficult uh, uh, conditions of planning, but there's also a new interest in alternatives. Um, there's new municipalities, uh, cities uh, that are actually creating completely new policies. Uh, there's civic engagement, and there is, of course, as we know it, uh, big scale protests um, and demands for system change. So um, what I'm really interested in and what I um, would really like to, let's say, um, also discuss and continuously work with um, uh, during in my teaching is what is the agency of architecture? What is our agency in within such a condition? So if I think of fields of agency, then of course um, there is this um, missing urban concepts or visions. What kind of city would we want to live in? What kind of city would answer actually to, um, to the number of crises? The inaffordability of urbanity and most of all the inaffordability of housing. We have an enormous housing crisis um, in many of our cities um, and uh, Munich is of course um, just one of them where housing is a very, very big topic. So exploding rent costs uh, plus, and that goes hand in hand, the privatization of public infrastructure and of public space. And all of that is even based on an increasing speculation with urban land, um, privatization, uneven development, commodification, which leads to lack of publicness and um, like basically having taught in London the last uh, year, but um, you can find that just as much in Munich as in Vienna pops in terms of privately owned public space, business improvement districts, etc., etc. So um, there's a lot of um, fields, we would say, the question is only how um, to act, right? So, um, um, okay. So what I looked into, and uh, please bear with me, um, I'm going to show you examples of my work and projects in a moment, uh, but I promised um, to actually um, um, have this theoretical body of, um, of work also with me and uh, bring it along to you in order to actually um, base possibly like um, the agency or, or the acting of architecture also within these questions. So um, looking into why do we have a crisis of planning, one of which is um, that um, there was and has been and still is going on a necessary critique of something like modernist planning in terms of master planning, in terms of um, feeling that we can actually top down plan, position, order the world. Um, so the critique of uh, master planning um, or modernism since the 1960s was either to call it, to, to actually uh, uh, analyze it as too top down, anti-democratic, tabula rasa as we know it, uh, or as our discourse in architecture claims, or from the other side, it was even critiqued of not being not liberal enough for the markets being inefficient. And um, to, to get a long story very short is um, that um, while modernist planning was comprehensive, like basically keeping everything, uh, planning everything, uh, it turned throughout time uh, into communicative planning, more based in participation, in collaboration, and in what is sometimes uh, told, uh, we're sometimes told in kind of eye level um, communicative um, processes. So just to um, show this in terms of images, this is of course the very famous um, image of Le Corbusier um, as the master or godlike master, um, a god-like figure of uh, his plan, uh, top down, couldn't be portrayed, I would say, more clearly. Um, the, uh, the, um, and we all know also that the Plover service was uh, then financed by the airplane and automobile producer, why sir? And if we think of that um, in terms of um, today, then uh, we are seeing um, also, be it not master planning, uh, but basically projects um, with hands over the city, as you see them here as well, 
while these are the investors um, and uh, possi like possibly uh, this project, and this is one of the pro uh, projects uh, in Vienna, which was uh, not top-down designed, but just, you know, like kind of one master planner, but supposedly with a collaborative, uh, cooperative uh, process, um, um, all stakeholders supposedly on eye level, um, and it's a public-private partnership process, um, I would claim that we have a, a different condition, but not a better one. We still have, uh, we now have the process financed by the investors uh, and maybe um, not so much the master plan. Um, and we still have a clear kind of uh, authoritarian um, um, aspect or um, take on the city. So while we actually have a history of withdrawal of the planning by critiquing the master plan, we also um, would have to talk about the experience of planning dilemmas. And Manfredo Tafuri, um, who was one of the strong critics um, of uh, modernist uh, comprehensive planning, would actually um, claim that um, all planning always works for the powerful. And that is actually the drama of modernity. Uh, so for him, like, and, and for a lot of um, architects and planners, it seemed that critical planning is impossible. So um, if critical planning would be impossible, um, that gets us into a dilemma, of course. And um, I hope everything is okay there. F finger up, yeah, you hear me well? Okay, perfect. Because um, um, this is basically, this is one of my um, favorite writers, uh, Giancarlo De Carlo, who, um, has, who has been a very poignant uh, critic, um, to a time, two high modernist times, when actually in the 1920s, many famous architects worked uh, very creatively on the housing for the existential minimum. Meaning that also then there was a housing crisis um, and architects around the world were actually asked to design ever and ever smaller apartments in a very creative way you imagine. And we all know these um, images um, of the, the models of like ever smaller spaces, like we call them tiny, tiny housing today, where the beds would fall down and tables would go up to the ceiling, uh, uh, being showing, or like, let's say, um, the displaces would get smaller and smaller. So Giancarlo De Carlo actually said, um, while these architects were intensively asking themselves how how to actually design the housing for the uh, existential um, minimum. They never asked why, or they never asked what. Uh, so in this uh, sense, um, the claim is um, that we should actually ask ourselves before we get into the immediate why, before we get into how do we do that, uh, I'm sorry, not into the, into the immediate how, in terms of technicalities, uh, into the questions of what and uh, why. So, um, in terms of um, uh, this human humanitarian ethics um, of the um, architects in the 1920s, um, they accepted that they had to plan for an existential minimum, which is very, very comparable to um, planning today when we have to accept, uh, we, when we would be supposedly um, having to accept um, that we build and plan ever smaller housing units, for instance, or ever smaller rooms. So the drama of modernity, if we were to say so, um, would mean that architecture and design are functionalized by advanced capitalism. And we could say, and this now gets us into a real dilemma, that architecture is nearly per definition an appeasement strategy for social injustice. Planning seems not to change injustice, but only to compensate by creativity, humanitarian design, etc. So what does that mean? Should we stop planning? And this is actually what, what, what we could kind of historically nearly um, analyze as uh, the reac such reactions were possibly to say, okay, well, let's stop planning. Yeah? Let's stop planning even if it was already kind of the most um, uh, justice-driven one, like for instance, advocacy planning or so. Um, advocacy planning turning into militant planning at some point, um, uh, the reaction of architects to, um, be, like turning into situationist um, autonomy, and as I already mentioned, participation or cooperation. 
So um, if we think of such dilemmas as an ethical challenge, then we could actually, um, because it is an ethical challenge, and, um, and in fact, uh, the question is, how can we still act as an architect um, or as architect uh, while we know about um, this problematic situation? So uh, we would actually, um, if we go along with um, Oliver Machat, who is a political um, theorist in Vienna, we would have to make a distinction between something like ethical politics or ethical democracy, which would supposedly be uncompromising. Like everybody gets happy. And we all know that no planning can ever make anybody, like can ever make everybody happy. So it's impossible. So um, if we turn it around, we could go for political or democratic ethics, which would actually say, okay, we, if we continue to plan, we may actually be in the gray zone of also having dirty hands. We have to get ready to get involved. But with doing this, we need to find possibilities um, that are, however, kind of uh, doing um, the best of the situation that's possible without losing sight of justice. And this is serious in terms of like, if we are reacting to injustice, then we must kind of uh, try for justice as much as we can. And uh, we may do this in a pragmatic way, but certainly not in a cynical way. So uh, exactly not um, uh, claiming that anyway, it's uh, whatever, for whatever reason, um, it wouldn't make no difference to do that or that. It always makes a difference to actually um, uh, choose um, for as, as, as good as possible, so to say. So what would that mean in the context of planning? As I said, it would mean, yes, let's get involved. Yeah? Let's acknowledge actors and concrete situations. Let's create alliances and try not to define, not to paternalize. And this is something very difficult because architects are very trained to know better about um, who we are planning for, to know very well, like what the people need and so on. And this is exactly what we must actually self-critique um, and self-distance ourselves from. Rather, asking what is my position as a designer? Which power claims are attached to design? Who is my design silencing? Or who is it actually could my design invite to speak? Um, there's many more questions of that. But so what I'm speaking about is basically a, um, a double movement. One of saying maximum engagement, or let's say the other way around, some sort of like distancing ourselves from what we know and from what we may have learned while being maximally engaged in like um, the conditions and situation. And I guess this is also what I really um, think of when I'm um, talking about just architecture. If we realize or if we, if we accept the fact that what we're doing is only architecture, it's just architecture, it cannot by definition and it cannot by itself um, neither kind of uh, save the world not completely change the world. Um, it cannot um, deal with all injustice. It's only architecture. It's just architecture. On the other hand, it may, as this only architecture, thrive for justice as much as it can. So it is, at the end, also just architecture in terms of fair, in terms of justice. And uh, if we think of this double move, then it's, it is accepting it is allowing us to actually act it is allowing us to do stuff to design to actually create a project um, and it is also asking us not to be cynical with this project but be very sincere in let's say the minimal politics possible in in our projects and that would be the other trust the second trust yeah so um be a little bit humble about what architecture is um but also be maximally demanding of what it could do. That um, would include, and this is again um, uh, also based on, on my book, um, would include that we are actually learning, that we're learning to unlearn, yeah? to unlearn our own privilege, maybe our expertise, without losing our expertise and that's really important yeah it's super important that we are uh, using our expertise to the maximum however unlearning our privileges and then however like it's not about romanticizing on um, um, identity 
and as I already mentioned, to build alliances, using our expertise uh, for partisan planning, for taking a position, for um, new hegem hegemonies. Um, what I hear is an example, for instance, uh, between um, queer activists and metal workers. That would be super if we would actually be able to um, achieve um, unexpected alliances uh, with um, architectural work. And uh, one of these, um, let's say, terms within these claims, um, uh, I framed it um, in German as vermessen fordern, yeah? in terms of like really remeasure, unmeasure, maybe unlearning to measure, but also to demand in a most presumptuous way, in a most, um, in asking most of it. For instance, uh, or we could say, let's say, let's ask luxury for all. Knowing that we are in the middle of an ecological crisis, uh, knowing, however, that the world is split very unequally and space is split very unequally. So with um, asking for more space or like for luxury for all, we are claiming actually in the first um, sense for a new redistribution of space. So, and this is the moment where we actually, um, I'm, I'm going to show you some um, examples of my work um, and, and um, we'll try to relate that um, to this theory. So, um, well, one, the first project is actually a school project. Um, it's a school um, for 1,000 kids. And um, part of that is a school um, building from the 1960s. You can imagine and see, do you see my mouse? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Wow. Okay. So um, all of this um, uh, has been built in the 60s um, and um, also this part. And uh, we, won an uh, we won a competition to extend the school with two other parts, which actually was quite nice to work on a 60s scheme and uh, create ever more. That's why this, this uh, project is called Five Courtyards for the Zenergasse, which is um, the address. Um, so we have a couple of different new uh, courtyards, all with different themes and so on. It works really nice, nice. But what I really want to talk about is A, that even though it was 1,000 students and 100 um, teachers, it was um, our very big concern and interest to actually have a process with them to uh, collaboratively look and know and find out what the school really needs. Um, what the extension in that the existing school lacked. So it was a beautiful process of actually um, having uh, the kids answer the teachers. Uh, they sometimes have, have uh, the better ideas um, than architects could ever have. However, as we all know, within such participation processes, it's super important never to promise anything that you cannot hold. Yeah? And that's uh, one of the uh, crucial first aspects uh, and second, also to be, yeah, to be honest from the very beginning, yeah, to basically be clear about um, also the frame of possibilities. Um, and when it came to, um, these are just um, images now that um, we've tried to creating also the climate crisis uh, and to the need for schools to ever actually be cooler than, <laughs> than, than better heated. Um, to have balconies every, like every, I, I, okay, sorry, my internet uh, connection says it's getting unstable, but I, I hope that I'm still there. You hear me? Yeah? Okay, super, perfect. Okay, so um, we have outdoor spaces um, in different ways for all of the different um, classes and rooms, be it such niches where um, the kids can actually hang out within the classrooms. Uh, the classrooms can be extra large and small, um, large terraces and balconies. Uh, and then there was this um, idea of an enormously, uh, of a roof terrace uh, spanning over the entire roof of this building. And this was an interesting moment because um, it actually, we, it got me nearly into a fight with the client because I wanted this roof terrace to span, as I said, until the edge of the entire uh, extension. And they didn't want a roof terrace at all. And why? Because they said, if we allow a roof terrace on this school, every other school will come to us and want one. So let's not build a roof terrace um, and uh, kind of describe uh, what we would call kind of um, describe mediocrity. And you can imagine that this 
was actually, um, of course, um, um, asking for me to fight ever stronger for this wolf terrorist, um, because obviously within, let's say, radical democracy as a concept, we would think, okay, yes, let's get them a roof terrace and hope that everybody else comes and asks for one as well. Because why not have roof terraces on schools? Um, especially, and this is the next question then, um, which schools would really need roof terraces? Um, um, and we know of many there. Um, but because there was such a discrepancy because between no roof terrace and, and an entire one, I had to make a compromise. And what you see here is that the roof is only half covered with the terrace. So in order to actually get the terrace, I did uh, make the compromise of saying, let's make only this piece. But what I could do was uh, with little money, because it was also of course all about money, I already prepared in the edge of the roof with steel um, extensions that later on, the school could itself actually extend the roof terrace and make it large. So um, sometimes to do a compromise does not need, uh, or like let's say, let's hope every time, like every time you do a compromise, maybe it's possible to not lose the larger picture, yeah, but do the small step while keeping the large step as a possibility still. And sometimes you even have to build in this possibility. So yes, of course, we did this roof terrace and I hope that all schools will have the roof terrace. And um, if I would think this now in terms of like uh, public space, then um, I just want to show you um, a kind of little project um, that we did for um, the Viennese Festwochen, which is an art um, um, program in Vienna. And it is, um, the location is uh, based around the city cinema which we as an office actually um, refurbished some time ago. And uh, after the refurbishment of the foyer of the city cinema, we were asked um, to, to do an, a public space project. And what we did is um, we actually designed what we called an, the Unrunde Tisch, a maximally long tisch, a table, um, running like basically as a table to stand, to sit, to lie on the floor, to become kind of a, a pergola, etc. A table to test out publicness, to actually invite people to use public space without consumption, without needing to um, have a restaurant um, on the side and, uh, and bring your own drinks, bring your own food. There's also a school of this. And it was quite interesting because honestly, it's quite in the center of Vienna. Um, honestly, at the end of the day, <laughs> people actually got delivered the drinks by the next, by um, restaurants garden. Um, and most of them actually consumed only from um, the restaurants uh, that was um, uh, just uh, feature, featuring uh, the drinks uh, next by. So, you know, sometimes that these um, tests um, are not really successful, but they are obviously at least um, showing quite well to what extent we also need to engage in encouraging people to use uh, public space um, in possibly all the different uh, modes that are possible. While again, because we are not um, top-down planners, we're not prescribing it. It's really building possibilities, but not um, necessarily kind of prescribing of how a space should be used in. So you can see how um, the, this, um, it's a very light um, wooden construction, which was nice because um, uh, in terms of um, uh, construction technique, we designed it in a way that it, we could dissemble it um, after six weeks, uh, put it into an archive, bring it back the year later and reassemble it. Uh, and this we did three times and the reassembling always took a different shape because these elements could actually be reassembled in many different ways. So um, public space is an issue that really um, uh, is important to me. And this is where um, I want to show you one other one, which is um, of a completely different other scale. It, um, is, it goes along the entire Donau Canal, um, which is the Viennese Danube channel that runs all throughout um, the kind of really center of Vienna. Also in this, the major uh, water front to Vienna. This is a project that um, I did together with my colleague, Susan Kraup. Um, uh, we won a competition in 2012, um, and it's a very long-term process. Um, we could say it's a top-down process. Uh, uh, we won the competition and collaborated with um, the city of Vienna. 
um, uh, Magistratsabteilung. Uh, we had like over 50 workshops uh, with uh, different people in uh, different um, uh, uh, public offices of the city of Vienna's government and um, administration. So what is this uh, the Donau Canal? The Danube Channel is what we, uh, the way we analyzed it, an enormously long park with regard or in, in kind of a comparison to other parks in the city. So it's a very important linear uh, space for um, recreation. But it's also a space for um, investment and um, uh, speculation, uh, if we want so. And uh, it's a very, um, it's become a hotspot and important, um, uh, want, a much wanted space for developers um, to be next to this area, as we see here with the Raiffeisen. And it's a space, it's become a space that is very, um, very crowded uh, with um, lots of people who actually want to um, enjoy the waterfront um, with lots of urban beaches, um, which came along with um, an activity of the city of Vienna to, to encourage um, investors to actually bring restaurants down there to establish urban uh, beaches, etc. So that actually by now, a lot, an enormously amount of the strip um, is um, commodified like this in terms of like um, uh, rented by private investors um, and um, uh, using it, um, developing it to, to, as urban beaches and gastronomy. But it historically also um, was a very important space for um, holidays and for uh, rest space. And as you can imagine during COVID-19, during the Corona crisis, it became enormously populated by people without consuming because the restaurants had to close they were closed and suddenly you had this space uh, exactly without uh, the need to consume or the consumption um, um, reserves. So, but here we see, um, of course, uh, like basically, so we have um, uh, recreation areas, but a lot of such um, urban beaches uh, where you can see that this is not during Corona, this is much before that time, that we have a lot of people uh, walk and uh, stroll around the edge and then these urban beaches getting closer and closer um, to the um, to the water edge, which you see very well in this um, in this image, I would say. Um, and um, there's also, and not only there, but I would say um, you can observe a conflict about the distribution of public space, the best when it comes to fencing. So um, the investors on the spot are usually making the most out of the area in, during the summer or hot um, area times, hot seasons, uh, while in winter, when it gets cold, they actually um, fence their um, site. Even you see here the urban beach, don't take it uh, away, but just put a large fence around it, um, leave, the, leave the site, come back next, um, next year while the city um, of Vienna actually established uh, on the spot where um, uh, pedestrians and bicyclists meet um, a so-called fairness zone, meaning that in these spaces that you can move, that are not fenced off um, um, by private um, um, investors, that there you should actually be fair to each other, you should be nice to each other. So um, what I'm showing you here is the condition on which we reacted as planners, um, saying, okay, well, we have a problem there in terms of like commodification, in terms of uh, unfair distribution of space. And um, we went along and mapped this entire strip in this um, urban area, looked for all different um, and started to actually develop, develop, and now you could say nearly something like a master plan. And uh, we, we started off from a master plan that was already done before, and, uh, desi and designed guidelines um, in a nearly master plan way. And uh, I'm aware of the fact that this now sounds very uh, contradicting um, my master plan critique before, and I try to explain that in a moment um, what I'm, why I'm saying this. Uh, what we did is uh, we analyzed and developed instruments for this space. Um, we said, okay, what we need at the most, uh, in the beginning and foremost, is actually the preserving what is still public and is actually still usable space for the public on this site. So we looked into a planning instruments such as the Bebauungsplan, building plan, uh, or maybe zoning plan, um, as we know it, and we created an instrument um, from that uh, based on the Bebauungsplan, which we called Nichtbebauungsplan a non-building plan. 
and said, okay, we're using similar graphics, we're losing similar um, methods and techniques, but to actually describe the needs of the, built, of the, of the public space, of the non-built space. And um, to maybe get this more clear is um, red lines on white paper declaring very specifically all the areas that can never be actually commodified, that can never be built on, that should be clearly public and open publicness throughout any future development. And that may sound now very simple or even redundant, but believe it or not, if we don't do such plans, uh, such maybe even redundant plans, um, if we don't kind of um, inscribe ourselves, if we don't inscribe publicness into public space, then the, the process of privatization comes along very fast, which actually already happened there as much as in other spaces. So it's a clear instrument that actually counterbalances uh, and counteracts uh, the process of uh, quasi privatization by um, developers and gastronomy uh, by, by basically claims of the capital on, on a public space. What is interesting is that uh, the rhetorics of these drawings was important that they actually resembled the building plan, that they're so clearly, in order to actually have the same authority, to have the same power, they needed, um, we, we created some kind of similar abbreviations, uh, similar ways of um, uh, noting, of, um, of uh, grading notations. So, um, long we drew in very fully in the scale of one to 500, um, the so continents, uh, developing um, um, Ermöglichungsräume, potential zones, uh, so next to kind of zones that we clearly declared as not to be built on and kept for recreation, other areas that uh, were meant to be uh, potential zones for short-term uses, while there was commercial areas which we couldn't uh, change anymore and which are already sufficient. Um, and also um, this project is called um, Partitur, Donaukanal Partitur, so it was um, also about a certain rhythm to, to make sure that there's a rhythm between, um, let's say, commercial spaces and non-commercial spaces, but also and even more so um, of uh, public infrastructure. So we read this space, finally, as a linear space, as a linear space, as a partitur, um, a notation space, um, and looked within this second instrument um, into the different uh, rhythms of, uh, say, it's public toilets, um, possibilities for cyclists, uh, water accessibility, uh, barrier-free accessibility, and um, to, to think the space in this more abstract way actually allows to, to really, uh, again, find uh, synergies or alliances between many different planners, between possibilities in this area, and also it shows very clearly deficiencies in terms of like um, uh, distances between public infrastructure, lack and, um, and missing infrastructure. So while we said, okay, we want to actually preserve and make sure that not much more of this space is being monopolized, we at the second uh, move actually asked for more public infrastructure to be installed in this place. So this is um, just one of the stretches um, of uh, um, partituren that we uh, developed, uh, which with many different layers, which we could actually um, ch exchange and um, and by exchanging, finding different um, uh, aspects and parameters in the partituren. So what did this project do? While we did this project, and it was a long process, um, these um, beautiful public stairs um, were actually claimed by an investor. An investor who wanted to actually um, place, um, and build all the stairs in order to have a restaurant right by the water. And the great thing was that while this was a claim by somebody, and it was a very complicated issue how that could even happen, we had already drawn up the non-building plan for this site. Do you hear me? Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Um, we already had um, uh, drawn this non-building plan for this very specific site. Uh, which is, um, um, and you can see it's red lines all over the place. Um, so uh, we used this document or we used our plan to fight the privatization of this space. And uh, luckily with a lot of kind of engagement, uh, we could prevent the space from being um, 
spilled over from being quasi private. And literally every time I pass by these stairs, I feel like I built them myself, even though it was um, uh, part of uh, the large scale Otto Wagner, you know, more than 100 years um, ago um, uh, design. But to sometimes preserving is just um, as beautiful as actually building yourself uh, when it comes to actually saving space um, for the public, as you see here. And in a very similar way, this also happened with um, uh, another space. This was a, a, the last uh, a green um, area, flat area, in a very good sunny place, beautiful. Um, and here you already see a protest um, sitting on this um, uh, lawn. Um, this happened, why? Because basically while we were, again, or after we were doing the process, um, an, another investor together with a local politician claimed this space, which we so clearly um, described in our non-building plan as the space for recreation and not ever to be kind of uh, built on, um, claimed it for a gastronomy and the private use. Um, and actually, while our plan was nearly forgotten um, by the administration, um, it was this protest that went there and actually occupied the, um, the site and fought for it. And what was the most beautiful thing is, they referred to our plan, to the Donau Canal Party Tour, and claimed and asked the politicians to make sure that this declaration of non-building on this site to be fulfilled. So um, what happened there is actually, um, and this is a clear act of popular agency, the protesters for this um, um, urban field activated the political potential of our plan. Yeah? In our plan, we had a clear anti-neoliberal or anti-growth, if you want to, anti-continuous privatization agency. But without the popular agency of these protesters, um, it would not have been act actually activated in this sense. So our plan somehow hoped for a pop popular engagement. Uh, and actually, this is why the togetherness of these two things um, made um, finally actually was success successful and um, and the site is still um, open to the public. So what this is um, about is basically my claim is uh, to to have a, to to think in a combination of working with the institution uh, for us as architects to actually possibly like really not to be too worried about sometimes having strong uh, planning. And this is why I uh, said master planning in the beginning. We, we didn't say the word master plan, but it was clearly a very strong setting, a very um, strict plan, but it was meant to be debatable. Yeah? And it was meant to be actually activated or not activated by popular agency, by um, having building up alliances, which uh, beautifully happened um, on this side. Okay. If we do have um, some time left, I would um, show two last um, housing, like, uh, housing projects, um, which uh, relate to the housing conflicts um, I mentioned in the beginning. Is that okay? Yeah, it's nice to have you um, here with me in the space. Um, so um, this is an advertising that was um, in Vienna. It's really just a stand-in for um, many of such advertisings that you, the way you could actually find them. It's small uh, in uh, writing, so I will have to, to love Vienna, owning them will do. So um, I guess you can, um, yeah, it's not ad busting. This is meant very, very real. Um, it basically, I would say, describes in the most direct way what um, beton gold, concrete gold is about, or what um, the financialization of housing is about. Um, to own an apartment without needing to use it is basically, it's a financial product. Housing as financial products uh, in the very centers or in the very good um, locations of our cities. And it's written very clearly as facade. You know, it's not even hiding. It's like, it's become so mainstream, it's become so normal that we pass by it and are not infuriated about um, such a sentence. Well, we are, uh, actually I am, that's why I'm showing it here. Um, but um, I'm also interested in other in inscriptions. Um, and so if we walk, if you walk through Vienna, 
then you'll find many such inscriptions from the time of Red Vienna. This is when kind of over 60,000 um, Gemeindebauten, uh, over 60,000 communal housing units, not Gemeindebauten, 60,000 Gemeindebauwohnungen, so housing units that are um, owned by the community, uh, by the communal, uh, by the commune, by the municipality, were built. And at this time, the politicians and um, city administration actually also wrote on the facades of these buildings. And I'm going, uh, trying to um, um, translate this right away. So this says, this building is built by the city of Vienna, yeah, by the municipality of Vienna in the years 1925 to 26, through the means of the housing tax. And I'm saying tax very clearly. Can you imagine today any government or politician that would write proudly a tax that they just invented to redistribute uh, from the rich to the poor onto their facades? It's like, we, we just have to kind of picture that and not in small letters, but basically in red, big, bold font. Um, and I'm showing you one image of this endless, um, because most often in very large of, large uh, communal houses, um, they actually wrote this not only on one facade, but on many, many sides of this. Uh, so the beauty is while we see this in contemporary Vienna, we also still see many of these notions and many of these inscriptions also in the same city. So this is where I'm interested in saying, okay, there's something to inherit from this time. And, and for instance, uh, we did um, uh, the um, Toledo Edachai graphic designers. We um, did a couple of um, uh, drawings where we basically were photo montages where we said, okay, why not think of like, um, contemporary or future um, new versions of such, um, uh, of such inscriptions. Yeah? Why not think that something has been built by the means of a heritage, a her inheritance tax, yeah? or by a luxury tax, a new luxury tax, a CO2 tax, you name it. Yeah? Um, and actually starting to think architecture again, the In a way, um, one, this project, I would say, does that uh, in, a, in a small scale. Um, it's um, what we call the interse intersectional city house, um, a project that we were lucky as an office to support um, in 2016. Um, it's a very um, uh, normal house in the 16th district. It's rented as in one piece by the Rhein für die Barrierefreiheit in der Kunst im Alltag und im Denken which is an amazing um, um, uh, Verein, an amazing uh, group of people uh, who actually take intersectionality, um, how should I say that, um, to its, ex not extremes, but uh, who is, uh, this uh, Verein is um, organized, extremely, in not organized, is, um, uh, is in itself very intersectional. Um, there's people from the LGBTQ plus um, uh, community, um, immigration, like um, kind of pro-immigration, um, people in, uh, like they come from different handicaps, um, in wheelchairs, uh, people living there with and without papers. So um, barrier freeness, barrier freiheit really meant to be um, in all its senses, not only kind of physically, but also that everybody has the right to live uh, together in a place like this, uh, no matter of the um, of your color of your skin of where you are from of what what papers you have etc so uh, while we're talking of a group of people who are kind of experiencing um, marginalization in an intersectional way this house um, that we designed or refurbished with them we organized we organized it in an intersectional way physically or like um, like uh, spatially by actually using the entire house as one housing unit with one central kitchen in the ground floor. So it's basically, there's no extra apartments, but all of that is a combination of, I think I have it here, of many different, or many, it's not so many, but um, like a, a bit over 20 separate uh, small private units, private spaces, plus uh, because the entire house is one housing unit, uh, all the circulation space and so on becomes also a communal space. So communal space, circulation space, one very large uh, central communal kitchen, 
and then private spaces up there um, in different sizes, in different uh, qualities, in different um, uh, positions. The way this group is organized is actually um, uh, uh, in terms of solidarity economy. Um, when we designed and did projects, um, actually I, I observed them and took them half an hour, and this is actually a shot from this moment, to uh, discuss how to finance their monthly payments, as they clearly um, they had a clear goal that everybody pays who uh, only how much he or she can pay, and not depending on the square meters of the room. So, like for instance, um, the inhabitants uh, who are using a wheelchair have to have a much bigger space than somebody who can just be in a small space. No matter if you are in the sun or in the shadow, in the third floor or on the ground floor. Um, the idea was like solidarity based economy, everybody pays how much he or she can at this moment. And it literally only took them two rounds to collect the monthly payment. And they're, they're doing this, we, um, they are redoing this again and again. And uh, it's a beautiful way of basically also having a backup plan. Like if I'm actually at this moment better off, I can pay more now, but uh, it may just change very quickly. And then somebody else may be better off and actually uh, take over my part as well. Um, so that um, this barrierefreie, barrierefreiheit um, in terms of accessibility um, is fighting for is that accessibility to housing, not only in terms of like physically, that everybody and what we did here is uh, even though this uh, group did have hardly any money, we, we changed this entire house uh, to be barrier free, to be step free, to have an elevator, to have um, um, to every corner of this house to be accessible by everybody, no matter um, how physically, um, uh, in, in what physical shape, but also economically and of course socially. And in this sense, uh, this building, this project is also relating to, again, historic notions, one of them being the self-built or self-help uh, concept of the settlement movements. And it's, it may be something like a contemporary or future version of the settlements that were kind of 100 years ago on the outskirts of the cities, for instance, in, in Vienna, now being right in the center of the city, looking for houses that are not used anymore, which um, um, this building that I just showed you um, was able to be rented at, in, in one place because of it um, uh, needing <laughs> users, so to say. But also the group built most of it themselves. And it also relates to a second historic notion, which is the so-called one kitchen house. Um, one kitchen house being in Vienna, but um, again, claiming for, um, uh, and this is of course talking about uh, the work of uh, reproduction, um, saving time and money for women, men taking care of households. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I think there's like, not, not only I think, but we know that there's still a gender imbalance, uh, uh, but thinking a one kitchen house in terms of um, having the central kitchen, of course, in our house in a bit of a smaller scale, but then um, uh, so the central kitchen being there for um, everybody else uh, within their private rooms, um, be the social place, but also of course um, sharing space um, when um, uh, you don't have so much, um, but also um, it, it's, it's become a very important central place um, for the community, for the group um, that is living there. Okay, and this of course, um, rather like this than, um, um, than this large building that is um, the Heimhof um, of the 1920s in Vienna. So the intersectional city house actually talks about the right to housing, the talk to reuse vacancy, um, self-build and do it yourself. Um, it's um, in this sense logically ecological. It's uh, supporting the neighborhood, uh, solidarity economy. It is a lift solidarity model. Um, uh, its um, association and uh, whoever can live there and uh, is given space there. It's also an obvious critique to racism, ableism, discrimination in the housing market. Uh, and with the sharing economy of the co-housing as a one kitchen house, um, it's a model maybe also alternative to what we see in sharing economies in housing quite a bit now. 
and I'm sure you're all aware of um, kind of uh, houses that that have a lot of community spaces and so on um, in um, the usual kind of social housing market. Um, and um, I would claim there again, if it's it should not be prescribed, but it should be self-wanted. Yeah. Uh, if people actually say, I want a collective kitchen, I want collective spaces, it's a complete difference to actually the market saying, oh, let's put out some um, functions into shared facilities in order to save space. And um, and the question of like self-help, self-organization versus um, top-down um, uh, notions of, um, of scarcity or of... Um, of reducing um, space is, um, uh, I would say, the, the most important difference here. And that brings me to my last project, uh, which is called um, uh, a group that is called Schlor. And um, they actually it's an abbreviation of like Schöner Leben ohne Reihweisen or Schöner Leben ohne Rondite, Schöner Leben ohne um, Räumungen. Um, it's a part of um, Habitat, um, uh, which I will explain to you in a moment. Um, this is um, part of the group of um, quite young uh, clients that we're working with at this moment um, in my office. And this is the project that we've developed with them and for them on an existing site, um, kind of an industrial, uh, semi-industrial um, um, site where um, there's some existing buildings, uh, all of them which we actually um, analyzed um, were able to be built, uh, to be kept. Um, here garages uh, which will be turned into workshop places, etc a large um, uh, hall that will become a circus center. Um, then um, we're planning extensions to have ateliers and also um, housing uh, of the people, of a certain group of people who is actually running then two different um, notions of um, um, like basically um, um, uh, community centers, community center for sport for the neighborhood and also community center, which can be a seminar and um, workshop, um, kitchen, uh, collective um, uh, um, ateliers and shared ateliers um, for the neighborhood. All of that non-profit uh, or like uh, limited profit um, as they're actually, um, sorry, this is just the site, the site in Vienna, and this is the way it looks now. So you just, you can imagine how we're turning this um, into, um, into that, um, like speaking architecturally in terms of drawings. Um, but uh, not only um, have they uh, organized themselves, um, and as the name already implies, Schöner Leben ohne Reifersen, the concept was that, um, again, it's not about having money, but actually organizing yourselves money but in different ways. So their concept was not to need a bank for such a project, but actually by crowdfunding and by direct um, um, crediting, direct, uh, direct credit campaign to actually organize. Um, um, and they managed, uh, they literally managed to have uh, all the money together for the project. Um, um, and, and I think the more important thing than the direct financing um, or the independent one is, that the project actually is one of a few projects which in Vienna or in Austria is building up something similar to in Germany is called what in Germany is called Mietshäuser Syndikat, um, which is basically Habitat. Habitat is a syndicate structure that is um, the, the base for a couple of projects or for hopefully ever more projects uh, which are uh, organized um, in associations in groups of people who self-organized um, actually um, buy certain buildings or pieces of land out of the market and by buying it literally kind of um, um, like not not renting it but buying it uh, at once putting it together with a syndicate structure and making sure that it's collectivized and it can never be speculated on again um, this is a bit similar to, as I said, Mietshäuser Syndikat. Um, as a syndicate structure in Germany, there's already 134 projects of theirs. Um, uh, what, what does that do? Basically, um, the idea is that all these projects can be self-organized, um, can be independent, um, can, uh, but they support each other. And um, they are working in a way which is basically the basics for any solidarity um, uh, concepts within housing that whenever the costs for rent would actually decrease uh, which is logical by any building um, that um, let's say the rent stays at a 
normal uh, price, but it never goes higher. And that's the op very opposite to the private market. And um, there's a gap, which can be a solidarity contribution, Solidarbeitrag, which actually can be given for new projects and for new kind of uh, concepts of, um, of collectivizing of, um, of housing and collectivizing of, um, of, of what was and used to be um, privately owned um, space. So while um, the um, uh, uh, Schlor, the people from Schlor are actually working on their concept of um, financing, of collectivizing, of making sure that it's actually um, part of uh, building up a structure that is uh, ever more growing, um, we are doing the architecture for it. Um, and that's the beautiful part of, uh, of course, of again, building these alliances um, that we are supporting them a lot with uh, ways of like building um, in an ecological and kind of uh, a sustainable way but also we're supporting them a lot in terms of like uh, process of uh, building uh, construction times etc and we are we're just about to actually build this part um, and the construction will start in i hope in one week actually and why am i showing this we're also building in straw in straw and uh, clay construction and the Possibly uh, the group also thinks of um, also doing some work themselves, much less than the group before. Um, but um, but it is already kind of, uh, they're already there. They're already uh, reworking and organizing uh, their space. So if I come back to this, um, um, to this project, then it's also very much based, very similar to the um, intersectional city house, um, using, not owning. And it's most of all working on bringing um, what used to be privately owned uh, housing uh, spaces, um, housing um, um, units or also uh, land out of the free market economy and um, getting it into kind of um, sorts of um, uh, collectivized structures um, in terms of non-governmental initiatives. This is the Mietshauser Syndicat in Germany. In Austria, it's called Habitat. Um, it could, I'm sorry, it could also be land trusts. Um, and what I'm why am, am I bringing this project is um, I do believe in such um, self-initiated uh, projects just as much as actually in, in council housing uh, and co-housing that are structures that have been established. Um, and that's why I also showed the uh, demanded um, um, uh, history just briefly. I think we need both. Public housing is actually maintained maybe opened up uh, to a more democratic process of um, accessibility where, where that isn't given, but also that there is kind of the possibility for popular agencies such as for Schlor or uh, the intersectional city house um, uh, group of uh, people to actually self-organize and have access to build housing them, themselves just as much. So let's make sure that whoever has the time and energy and will to organize themselves in making the city and collaborating um, with building, so to say, the city as a rights to the city um, has the possibility to do so. But also, and that's really something that I find most importantly as well, is um, for anybody who does have no interest in actually organizing themselves in a group, uh, uh, collaboratively designing the way of housing, it needs to be made sure that everybody finds um, affordable housing just as much. And this is a collage that uh, is a critique that I did together with my colleague um, um, uh, Chang Yuchu uh, on one of the large scale uh, housing projects in Vienna, uh, where we claim that um, there's only one third of uh, social housing, one third of medium price houses, housing all around this area, and one third of quite high um, private um, uh, market housing. And what we are asking here for is like for the fourth, the fourth third, yeah, the security people claiming or asking that um, within a lot of such um, measurements and a lot of, um, a lot of moments when in public, uh, in public planning, actually there's calculations, um, quite a number of people or maybe um, a quarter, so to say, or a third is actually missing or not thought about. And this is something that we should always, um, again, and this is maybe the agency of an architect um, in a different way in terms of um, raising our public voice, uh, which we also did with this installation um, 
this, uh, the project itself um, that we're critiquing here has a beautiful um, center park. And um, what we're saying is there shouldn't be any center park without everybody it's claiming that um, if we are involved or like um, we are all involved um, as um, users of the city and also of course um, as um, architecture students who will be involved in the future we as architects are involved in the making of the city and um, this brings me back to the notion of just city if we see injustice uh, we may just clearly also um, talk about it and uh, bring it up in order to actually um, see that things are changing um, to a different notion. This is um, in a maybe some pathetic way um, my ending, um, which is um, claiming to say, okay, it's just architecture that we're doing, but why not do, the, do it in a just way? Or why not just? Thanks so much. Thank you. Maybe you could... Um... It's so nice, you're clapping. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, where is my... Um, I know. Um, I would like to show my video again. Okay. Yes, um, you, somebody stopped it, I think. You stopped it. I stopped it because no. of the bad audio connection. <laughs> okay, can you stop it again? Um, or can you start it again? That's a good question. <laughs> um. But I'm happy I actually didn't have to see myself all the time. Okay, I think uh, I asked. Yes, Sorry. yes. Hello, here I am. <laughs> Great. Yeah, well, thank you for the talk. I think it's really inspiring us to critically ask um, who we are planning for and to become architectural activists, maybe, in a way. Um, I, and I think you were already talking touching upon a lot of aspects of the whole topic. Um, and now I have some questions for you. <laughs> yes. Um, the first one, um, the first question, question was um, about the topic of what is the agency of architecture? And um, he asked, but are all the strategies you are proposing not much more in the responsibility of politics? Uh, yes, I think it's a very nice question uh, you're asking. Um, a, um, I am, as you can imagine, also really interested in politics. And this is why also uh, part one of uh, my book is uh, based in politics, uh, but then in the politics of um, housing, of uh, urban planning. And, um, and yes, um, I guess this is where, where I wanted to describe that not all architects have to become politicians, but um, uh, in order to also bring kind of um, in this notion of politics or actively um, work on this um, in this area. But I do think that all architects should be aware of um, the political aspect of architecture. And, um, and when we are aware of it, um, we are not risking to be naive about it. And we are also not risking to be cynical about it. Um, and um, that does not mean now that, that again, um, uh, we all kind of need to engage hardcore in, in literally kind of uh, politics or in party politics or whatever it would, would kind of be. But um, we, are, we do need to actually see to what extent we want to be complicit. And, um, and there's something about um, a, an understanding that we do not have to be complicit all the time that there's a possibility of saying no. There's a possibility of actually, um, there's always the possibility of saying no. There's always possibly um, alternatives to maybe what um, politicians or what politics sometimes claim. So um, uh, I guess, yeah, my agency is to make aware of the um, political implications um, and conditions of architecture and urban planning. And uh, by that, um, yeah, um, I agree fully with you. Um, and I think this is also where, um, how should I say that, um, where this notion of um, just architecture is, is exactly what, what um, supports me there, or like what, what I find supportive is, um, okay, sometimes architecture is just architecture. It's not politics, eh? per se, per definition, um, but it can, 
itself, it's a powerful um, thing also. And architects are um, public figures. Architecture itself is a public thing. Even if you build a private home, it's, it's of a public interest. So um, that I would say there's um, a whole area of agency that architects employ not enough. Yeah, thank you for answering. Andres Lepik, who um, asked the question on the YouTube channel, also says thank you. <laughs> um, Is that who asked, the, uh, who asked the question? Andres Lepik, our professor. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> um, then we have another question from Lucas. He asks, what is your opinion about liquid democracy concepts like the German Piraten part is proposing? Partei. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also die, sozusagen die Konzepte der Piratenpartei. Okay, um, uh, what a question. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, um, I, I'm going to answer that in the most um, frustrating way for the for the person who who, who asked <laughs> saying okay well I'm I'm really interested in the radical democracy and democracy um, and I'm really not um, uh, yeah I haven't followed at all kind of what Piratenpartei is um, um, is asking or um, has been kind of um, set up there I, I wouldn't know is the Piratenpartei still a, a, an existing political figure, or like a party in, in Germany? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. What are you laughing about? No, we're just discussing um, who's able to answer the question properly. <laughs> It's still existing, but I couldn't Good. really tell. Yeah. Um, how important it is right now, actually. <laughs> Sorry, say it again. So there was a question about a um, project of yours, um, but I'm not sure which project he meant because it was right in between the video. So we were not sure which project. I think he can ask himself though. <laughs> it was about the Donau Party tour. If there was a participation process in the project. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. That's a great question. Um, because I consciously showed the um, participation process uh, for the school um, and I We can't hear you anymore. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Good. That's the beauty of um, of uh, liveness. I would say. I insisted on being live with all its contingencies that it has. Um, do you hear me? Hello. Do you hear me? Yes. <laughs> can you hear me? We yes, did. I can hear you. We did. Okay. okay, okay. I'm going to do it without video for the moment. Um, um, so the question is really great. Um, I've, I'm asked this all of uh, radical democracy and, um, and of course we, we could understand uh, radical democracy within the project of um, the Donaukanal party tour as one to say, okay, could we not have a process of um, asking, let's say the two million Viennese of what they would want um, of this space um, the most. And um, I would say that um, this is exactly where we realized um, this. And I would uh, generally, I, I think that there's an issue of scale when it comes to methods and processes of um, engagement and um, uh, participation. And I, I think you've also heard that, um, well, I, I kind of mentioned that of course, um, I'm critical of um, 
such uh, participation processes, um, which Klaus Selle would uh, call participatement. Um, so um, no, there was no participation process um, in the Donau Canal Capital Project because exactly for the reason of saying, okay, we cannot, we don't know a method um, or instruments that would actually allow for all the possible users space these possible users want to engage with is being more and more threatened by privatization and commodification. So um, we could say that um, the method of planning we applied there um, is similar to maybe equity planning. Um, it's a more a kind of a, a strong planning technique that says, uh, okay, let's take responsibility as a planner at this moment to actually secure the space, the public space, in, for in the future, for these two million people to find the place to actually do whatever they want. So we are not asking them what do they want the space or the place um, to be for, but we are securing the place to be there when they come, when they want to use it, and they can freely use it um, in for um, whatever in, in whatever way. Uh, so it's a very, I would say, it's an interesting. Um, a challenge um, as a planner to to um, to really also kind of see in the different scales and in the different questions um, that we are asked in planning um, what uh, techniques and instruments um, to use and also to how to engage um, popular agency how, how to engage the public uh, but here to engage the public um, uh, is to actually secure the space for its use independent of knowing what it's for i mean we we know what public we there has been a lot of uh, of course um um a lot of uh, um questionnaires uh, projects and so on um, asking people what they would like to have uh, on donor canal so we also were very aware of the fact that we would not want to do this the hundred and second of these uh, questionnaires or of these processes while in the meantime actually the space is being more and more privatized so this would be exactly what uh, maybe participatement, um, the term by Garcelle would be about. Um, we could um, critique the current moment for um, having people um, be engaged and uh, work a lot in very small scale participation projects where the big, um, uh, let's say, uh, the big <laughs> game, the big gamble uh, around uh, urban space is actually um, happening without participation. So. Um, um, yeah, very importantly to us, very clearly, very conscious uh, choice to actually uh, employ something like equity planning, making sure um, preserving um, and uh, instituting space to be there for unknown users to and, un, and, and unpredictable uses, um, not only in the future, but uh, also, of course, uh, currently. And what was really beautiful is that, for instance, uh, during Corona, which is called uh, the Corona crisis, which of course was not a beautiful time, but um, we could really see how public space was a needed so much, obviously um, uh, in the times of um, uh, of lockdown. But then Donau Canal, for instance, was really one of the major places uh, that people started to um, to occupy and uh, and and use and find ways of um, uh, of usage exactly without um, gastronomy and without um, uh, those. Um, who are at this moment investing heavily there. Thank you. Thank That's you very much. Question. Actually, I think because of the time and the next scheduled point in the program, we are not able to continue with questions. But I think um, the most important ones have been asked. And I would like to thank you in the name of the whole team for talking to us today. And um, I hope we all could take something from your talk to our own future as architects. <laughs>